It's good to be here this afternoon, and uh, we're going to go through a couple of things about uh, uh, managing weeds and, and lawns uh, around this time of year. I'm not going to hit every single weed out there. I know I realize that, so if you have questions about specific weeds, um, please feel free to ask, and we'll see what we can do to, to brainstorm on that. The um, couple of ones that I would do may not seem like they're very difficult to control, um, but I'll go through the reasons why as I get into, into the discussion. Uh, before we get into it, um, let me do a quick safety share. We always like to do a safety share with FMC. And, you know, this particular safety share, I thought this was a really good diagram off of ergodyne.com uh, is where I got this. It's basically, you know, proper lifting techniques. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, you, it doesn't matter if you're lifting boxes or, uh, you know, bags of fertilizer or seed or whatever it may be um, at work or at home. You know, just make sure that you're aware of the weight of that of that uh, item that you're trying to 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 lift, if it's too heavy for you, ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. It's better to ask for help than to than to throw out your back or something like that. Make sure you you get a firm footing, so don't put your feet too close together. You know, wide. You know, at least shoulder length length apart. Bend at your knees as you're going down to get the load, um, and then. As you're coming up, you lift, you use your whole body, you're using your legs, your big muscles and tightening your stomach muscles. So it's going to be like a like a core exercise. It almost sounds like right. Uh, full body workouts. Uh, you're lifting with your legs, keeping your back straight. Uh, you want to make sure you try to keep that load close to you. Don't try to hold it back out away from you because that can cause you to lose balance. Um, and then as you're lowering it. Remember to, you know, bend at the knees and your hips, but don't go straight down. Uh, keep your back upright uh, until you release the load on where you're trying to get it. So just keep those in mind. You know, this common lower back injuries are very common. Sometimes you get in a hurry and uh, you don't have the time or you or you don't maybe not even have the help to, to get a heavier load. So just... Um, Keep these areas in mind as you're as you're looking for uh, uh, moving uh, different equipment or or items around that work in your in your house so and be safe. All right. As we get into uh, you know weeds, you know we always talk about what a weed is. A lot of different things in here. Basically, it's a plant out of place. Um, it's a it's a weed that is undesirable. It's breaking up the the aesthetics of the home lawn, uh, your customers or your clients are calling um, all the time asking you to, hey, this, this is in my yard. Yeah, yeah, I need you to come get rid of it. And all, not all the time, not every time, it's the best time to treat for that weed. So we'll kind of go over some of those uh, areas of weed management. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, ways to define a, lead, a weed, depending upon what uh, area you want to focus on. You know, certainly if you're more poetic, you've got this uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He's uh, trying to take a little bit of a, a more positive note on weeds. It means the virtues have not yet been discovered. Well, uh, sometimes we don't have that luxury to just wait around and see what happens to a weed and how we can... Uh, have that as a value but anyway um, long and the short of it it's a plant out of place or an undesirable plant um, there's a lot of different weeds that are out there there's annual weeds perennial weeds and then biennial weeds a lot of times we're dealing with annual and perennial weeds in, in turf grass an annual weed basically it's a weed that is going to complete its life cycle in a complete year uh, typically will develop from seed and grow vegetatively, produce a fibrous root system. And then once um, the, it reaches the end of its life cycle, it begins to form seed heads and uh, senesce and naturally die. Now, there are certain parts of the country 
where an annual weed can act like a perennial weed. Uh, the picture on the top right is a perfect example, goosegrass. You know, if you go down to southern Florida, uh, and I'm sure out in Hawaii, goosegrass um, can behave just like a perennial because it never really dies. There's no, there's no hard frost to kill off those plants and cause it to go into natural senescence and die. So that becomes a challenge uh, in certain parts of the country. Um, but in general, by definition, this is what an annual, annual weed is. Perennials, on the other hand, these are the weeds that uh, can reproduce by seed, but they also have some type of vegetative structure that they can reproduce from. So whether it be underground seeding bodies, like uh, this is Virginia buttonweed up here in the top right, uh, dandelion has very uh, deep taproot, taproot, excuse me, uh, that it can re-germinate from or re-emerge from, excuse me. There's weeds that have rhizomes and things of that nature. Tubers, if we're getting into nut sedge, all of these things are perennial weeds uh, that they can come back. And even though the top growth may die as the temperatures get colder and you're into the winter months, um, that underground reproductive structure has taken in the carbohydrates to uh, survive uh, the winter. And then once the soil temperatures get to a point uh, and the moisture levels are met, then they can reemerge and use that stored up carbohydrates as energy to produce new vegetative growth. And uh, their life cycle continues to, uh, uh, to, to develop. So, um, other options like this, and that's a lot of a lot of the times when we're talking about managing difficult weeds, this is what we're talking about. The perennial weeds, you know, in general are going to be much more difficult to manage than than annual weeds. So we'll talk a little bit of time um, about perennial weed management today. <clears throat> um, identification of weeds is very important, uh, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, grasses are going to be uh, and have they're going to look differently than broadleaf weeds. They're going to have different uh, uh, def identifying characteristics. Typically, you know, when you're talking about a a, a grass weed, uh, uh, you know, it's a gr uh, from the Graminaceae family or Poaceae family is is another is another family. Um, it has a a you know, long slender leaves and monocots uh, with parallel veins. You know, typically they can have inner nodes. Uh, some will have stolen, some will have rhizomes. So if you're talking about something like a, <clears throat> a Bermuda grass or a, a nimble will, you know, these are uh, grass species that can become weeds or that are weeds. Uh, they both have uh, stolons and or rhizomes. Uh, that make them very difficult to control when they're in an undesirable situation. So, for example, trying to get Bermuda grass out of St. Augustine grass or nimble will out of Kentucky bluegrass or tall fescue is a big challenge. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Sedges, uh, there's a lot of different sedges out there. A lot of them look very similarly without uh, uh, distinguishing uh, characteristic like a seed head, but all of them have one thing in common in that they have a triangular shaped stem with a three ranked leaf arrangement. So what that means is you have a, a leaf coming off each side of the triangle. Um, you know, you have yellow nut sedge and purple nut sedge. Those are your perennial sedges. Uh, there's a lot of different annual sedges, flat sedges. Um, this area of, uh, or excuse me, family of, uh, of weeds continues to grow and become a difficult problem when, you, when you're talking about weed management. Doesn't matter if it's in home lawns or, you know, if you get into the golf side or athletic field management, this, these are very uh, difficult to control, mainly because of these here, right here. These are called tubers. Sometimes uh, you'll hear people call them nutlets. 
Uh, but these tubers can go down, you know, and emerge from say 10 inches in the soil. Uh, now, most of your emergence is going to occur from tubers that are in the top six inches of the soil. Um, so that's why you have to manage this weed a little differently. The challenge is, um, aside from trying to determine what product you need to use, uh, is the expectations of your customers don't change, right? Because just because it's a perennial weed, that doesn't necessarily change the expectations of your, your customers or your clients. Um, they still want the weed gone. Um, so sometimes they're, you know, they may need to have some, ex some explanations or education uh, as you're communicating with your customers about, you know, the differences between this weed and say something like a crabgrass. Is, there's two different uh, ball games here that we're trying to to manage and play in. Um, Broadleaf weeds primarily are, are identified by their leaf shape. Lots of different leaf shapes. Uh, you know, we deal with alternate leaf shapes a lot in 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 turf grass. We deal with uh, weeds that have lobed uh, leaf margins. So you think about something like a dandelion or a, a hairy fleabane. You know, even some of the serrated leaf margins. Uh, certain situations you may have a, a horse weed or um, something like that. You can you can occur. And it can occur in in certain situations of, of turf grasses, but. Um, a lot of different things. And so it's important to, um, as you're going through identification characteristics, to kind of understand what what's what and what you need to be looking for. Um, and there's a lot of really good um, reference books and things of that nature that universities have put out. Uh, some of them are easy, nice you know, handheld pocket guides that go in through, you know, simple identification characteristics of weeds that you can you can look at uh, so if you don't have one already uh, in your uh, uh, truck or an office it might be good to have as you're out scouting uh, your customers properties or as you say um, obtain a new client or a customer uh, then you can develop a weed program a lot easier if you know what you're dealing with and that's kind of what how it starts really uh, as part of a successful weed management program um, first and foremost you got to understand what you're dealing with you got to know what the weed is because just because it's a grass weed doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be controlled by the same product you've always used for crabgrass so what if it's not crabgrass um, i'll use an example here in a minute about uh you know what that what that might be um you know we always try to prevent weed introduction as best you can that's always difficult especially as you're going from property to property you know the weed density um, may be different uh, as you're going around you know you can't control you know weed seed bank introduction or or say for example if you're airifying or, or something like that or mowing in and treating naturally you're going to uh, carry seed with you but you can if you're in a renovation standpoint or, or educating your customers about uh, seeding and things of that nature you make sure that you're buying um, clean sod you're inspecting the sod before you go buy it or before it's harvested uh, then you can come in and, and do that as best you can to, to maintain um, and minimize uh, weed introduction. Really, this is where, you know, the, the foundation is built uh, is on the properly managing uh, the turf grass that you have. Um, because, you know, 95% of the time, if you can develop and maintain a dense turf grass stand um, that's going to prevent a lot of your weed problems from from developing now you're going to need some cooperation as well from your customers right you, so they they've got an irrigation system you may have to ir you may have to educate them on how to properly use their irrigation system 
if they're taking care of the mowing and you notice that they're mowing too short, you may have to, um, you know, you may have an opportunity to, to educate them about proper mowing height. And if they continue to complain about, um, you know, a particular weed being a problem and their mowing height is too low, say, for example, they're mowing St. Augustine grass at an inch and their yard is full of, you know, crabgrass, dove weed, and whatever, then, you know, how can we educate uh, your customers to raise that mowing height to uh, be more competitive and outcompete some of these weeds? We talked about identifying the weeds correctly and learning life cycles of weeds. That's going to be very important because that has an influence of, our, of not only what product you use, but when you're making those applications. Um, and then uh, chemical and cultural practices to maintain uh, and manage those weeds. Those are um, things like, uh, you know, like mentioned proper mowing, you know, whether it be fertility, irrigation, you know, those types of practices and then the herbicides that you use. <clears throat> we get into some of the uh, basics of herbicide type and classification. You, I'm sure you're aware of this. This is, you know, selective and non-selective. So a selective herbicide is basically a herbicide that is going to control the weeds, but uh, not touch the, the desirable turf grass. So it has a high degree of turf grass tolerance, but selectively controls the weeds outside of that. Non-selective is something that's going to totally control everything uh, that is... Uh, photosynthetically active. So it's a, it's a product that you typically would use if you're making applications around, say, the bases of fences, or if you're in a renovation uh, situation, and you're trying to get rid of the, the vegetation that's currently there. Those are some uh, options and ideas of what a non-selective is. So selective, you're trying to keep the turf grass, but get rid of the weeds, non-selective, to trying to remove everything. Uh, you may hear, you know, terms like site of action and mode of action uh, when people are talking about herbicides or, or different groups. Um, one of the things that um, that we do at FMC and as well as a lot of other companies, as you'll notice on the front panel of the label and the, probably the upper, usually it's upper right corner. Um, you'll see a, um, a little box that says group, HRAC group, you know, four or 14. Uh, that tells you um, what mode of action, what herbicide group that is in. Um, so it, basically the two terms are, you know, the site of action is what it tells you the specific site where that active ingredient uh, is inhibiting a vile chemical pathway in the plant. So, for example, this is how uh, sulfentrazone or dismiss NXT works. You know, it comes in here and it disrupts this porphyrinogen oxidase um, uh, catal catalytic, catalytic uh, reaction here and uh, does not allow the plant to form pro protox nine, and uh, you see a buildup of basically uh, toxic molecules, which leads to um, basically cell walls to be blowing up. And, and what that looks like underneath a microscope in the mitochondria and things like that, as you start to see, you know, you know these cell walls break down and, and cell content starting to leak out. So it's, it's a really neat little process if you, if, if you're into that kind of stuff, but um, visually what that looks like is something like this. So um, typically from a PPO inhibiting herbicide, this is what you see. All right. So you see that quick browning of the weed very fast visual symptoms, say within 24 to 48 hours. Um, you begin to see that on broadleaf weeds, especially this is wild violet. So a uh, very quick response on wild violet. 
from um, I think actually I think this is solitaire. Uh, it's a combination of quinclorac and sulfentrazone. Uh, then you have other symptomology, uh, something like this. You may have seen this before. This is all uh, from an HPPD inhibiting herbicide. This is kind of a cool herb uh, symptom that um, develops when um, you know a product is applied and the plant can no longer produce carotenoids, and carotenoids protect the chlorophyll. Uh, from UV light. So without carotenoids, some, the UV light comes in and destroys the, the chlorophyll. And that's why you see the white uh, plant material or plant uh, uh, leaves uh, developing there. So that's where I kind of, uh, hopefully that was, that makes sense is, is that you get down into to the details of site of action and mode of action and understanding uh, those terms and then this is kind of an example of visually what's going on. But I think the, the take home message is, is that as you're developing your, your herbicide plans, you know, look at that box number up there, make sure you're not constantly using the same, you know, group number over and over again, because that, that can help with, you know, you know, resistance management and things of that nature. Uh, a couple of things that, you know, factors influencing herbicide efficacy, improper weed ID, we'll use this crabgrass versus goosegrass. Um, the same products don't control these weeds. You know, for example, quinclorac is commonly used for uh, crabgrass control, uh, can be an effect, a very effective molecule for crabgrass control, does not touch goosegrass. So, Know the, knowing the difference between these two grasses is very important because that will help you uh, determine which product is you need to use. We'll talk a lot about application timing. Uh, it's very important from an application timing standpoint, especially with perennial weed management, because you want to try to keep those applications in line with when that plant's going to be most susceptible to that herbicide. Uh, this, for example, is on green Kalinga. And by targeting you know, applications here, say in, in late May, early June, uh, we were able to get much better control uh, compared to later applications. Uh, this is with actually with the Smiths and XT. Um, so the same can be said for other weeds as we get in there. In there. Uh, and understanding the life cycle is some weeds like wild violet, ground ivy, even some of your perennial grasses, depending upon where you are, Dallas grass, sometimes fall applications can be more effective than middle of the season applications. Um, so understanding when that weed is most susceptible to those herbicide applications can greatly benefit you over time. Uh, and that doesn't say that that doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily stop having to make applications this time of year because why? Because you've got customers asking, hey, I need these, these weeds out of my yard. I've got this party coming on. I've got this, this, and this. I want a weed-free yard. You can't just tell them, well, I'm only going to sp spray in May and, and September. So, you know, sometimes when you're here making applications on specific weeds, it may take multiple applications. Wild violet uh, is a very prime example of that. Sometimes midsummer application, um, you may need sequential applications depending upon the product you're using because it's a much more difficult time to, uh, to control that weed uh, compared to uh, other timings like fall or spring. Um, another reason why application timing is very important is this weeds emerge and germinate differently. Now, these are three annual grass species that can be commonly found in home lawns, but they germinate very differently and they respond differently to, to certain herbicides. So, uh, again, understanding when these applications are, need to be made, whether it be a pre-emergence herbicide back here 
prior to the emergence. Um, you may need a sequential pre to control the later germinating annual grasses. Um, growth stages, this kind of is um, one thing to keep in mind, say for crabgrass, for example, and, and you're using um, you know, just a straight quinchloride product or, or, or something like that. Uh, and even other actives, I say quinchloride, but there's other actives, uh, phenoxyprop and things of that nature where they're going to be more susceptible. Um, crabgrass is going to be more susceptible to those chemistries when it's smaller compared to when it's larger. You know, you'll even see that on, on, on several labels saying, hey, if it's a, a bigger weed or if it's above this tiller, um, then you're going to need a much higher rate and you may need a sequential application. Um, mainly the reason for that is because the weed is growing so rapidly during that time of the, of the year, uh, it's almost like it, it, meta it over metabolizes or out metabolizes the, the effect of, of that herbicide as it grows. So the sequential application uh, over time is what's needed. Um, making sure you're properly calibrated I think that should be a routine uh, part of, uh, of any weed management program. Uh, don't just assume that your, your equipment is properly calibrated, making sure that you're making regular checks of your equipment, that the, the boom heights, if you're using a boom uh, type sprayer, that it's at the correct height to where it's going to uh, maintain the coverage that you need. Uh, if you're using, a, a, say, a, a a hand wand or a Kim Long gun, that type of ap uh, application. Make sure that everybody is practicing their techniques and uh, where that nozzle is at the appropriate height and it is delivering the right volume so you can get the best control there. And then with, um, same with backpack applications, if you're just doing spot treatments, you need to make sure that uh, that you know, the, the proper use rate is being used and also under, having an understanding of every time you make that pass over that specific weed uh, patch, you know, you can double the rate. So if you've got four ounces of the equivalent of four ounces to the acre or 0.2 fluid ounces per thousand square feet, that's for one pass over that weed uh, population. If you do another pass, then you just double the rate. So just educating and making sure uh, that's constantly being uh, promoted uh, within your team uh, will help out quite, uh, quite a bit as you're managing these weeds. Water quality is, is another one that people often uh, don't pay attention to. Uh, there's a lot of chemistries out there that can be um, sensitive to whether it be changes or P in pHs, water hardness. And, and the like. So just every now and then have your water source checked if you've got that, that ability to do that. So you can understand what's going on in your water, whether or not you need to adjust it or not. You know, and even as you're adding products to the tank, uh, that can change the pH, especially if you're using a lot of acidifying fertilizers in your mixes, uh, then you know, making sure you always want to just make sure that pH is between, say, five and a half and seven. Uh, that's probably the sweet spot for, for the majority of, of chemicals that are out there. We'll get into identification of a few uh, specific weeds. Again, some of these you may be asking yourself, well, why this is not really hard uh, to control weed, but I think some of the reasons I've already explained why I included them you know, mainly with something like crabgrass. You know, I, I picked crabgrass for this presentation because um, it is one of the most common weeds out there. Um, it's not necessarily a, a difficult weed to control, but it can certainly cause some headaches. Um, I think one of the times, uh, this one of the things is, is that this weed is confused with a lot of other grass weeds. I think that's where it creates problems. So I think first and foremost, you know, a starting point is if you understand what crabgrass looks like, then maybe that can help you 
not only with the application timing of controlling this weed from a post emergent standpoint, but also help you separate out this particular weed from the other weeds like foxtails or Johnson grass or, you know, other annual grasses, goose grass. I mentioned that earlier. Um, and there's there's a tremendous a number of different species of, of, of crabgrass. This is just smooth crabgrass. Um, it's a summer annual weed. Uh, the biggest thing with, with crabgrass is, with smooth crabgrass is the ligule. It does have a tall membranous ligule. Um, can have some sparse hairs around the collar region, but generally it's very smooth. There's no hairs at all. Um, you know, other weeds that have a tall membranous ligule would be Dallas grass or some of your perennial paspalums. You know, but one thing to watch out for that is that the hair characteristics on Dallas grass, for example, are going to be different, or even bull paspalum uh, are going to be different compared to uh, smooth crabgrass. And bull paspalum is going to have evenly spaced hairs along the leaf margin. Dallas grass may have hairs that are coming up a little further into the collar region compared to uh, um, uh, smooth crabgrass. And of course, Dallas grass and, and bull paspalum are going to have the more uh, dense uh, uh, root systems than in crabgrass. It's going to be more fibrous. Uh, you know, a lot of different uh, products out there to control crabgrass from a pre-emergence and post-emergence standpoint. I realize that some of these uh, products are, are not labeled for uh, uh, for residential use, um, but um, or may not be registered for 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 uh, uh, residential use. But the key is is I think with crabgrass is understanding one. Um, that you get a solid pre-emergence herbicide program down if that's what's in your program and then understanding as we mentioned before you know when the post-emergence products need to be applied relative to their growth stage you know you know we use something like a claim extra for example phenoxaprop they specifically list out on their label um as this weed gets larger in size you need to increase your use rate okay um, you know quinclorac alone by uh, for excel you compare something like drive to solitaire wsl um, you know they're a little bit different products and that this product here uh, both can be very effective on crabgrass early and late um, you broaden your weed control spectrum here with something like solitaire wsl um, but you get a little bit better control uh, in that middle section uh, with something like a solitaire. So um, understanding, you know, the finer points there, you know, those can easily be helped out with, you know, with, with whoever you buy your products from. But anyway, the main point is um, if you are strong on your pre-emergence herbicides, you're maintaining that, that turf grass the way it's going to be maintained and should be maintained, that's going to be very beneficial for you in the long run for crabgrass control because the more dense the turf grass, uh, the less crabgrass is able to get through that canopy and cause issues. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Goosegrass is one that's, that's starting to pop up a little more in, in home lawns. Uh, foxtail is another one uh, that you're starting to hear more about. Uh, these are both annual grasses that germinate later uh, in the season uh, than, than crabgrass. So crabgrass kind of germinates when soil temperatures are around 55 to 58 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, you're talking 60 to 65 degrees typically uh, with something like a goosegrass. Uh, this is uh, sometimes called silver crabgrass because of the white um, silver look in the in the uh, middle of the plant. A uh, very flat stem, you know. Typically, crabgrass has a more of an oval stem um, and a little bit different um, uh, 
a ligule with with goose grass. It's more of a um, a fringed membranous ligule. And, and if you peel that back, the ligule is kind of in between the collar and the the leaf blade. So if you peel the leaf blade blade away from the 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 uh, stem, it's almost like it's an M shape. That's a dead giveaway. Uh, separation from from crabgrass and goosegrass, as well as uh, uh, foxtails. Foxtails are going to have a hairy ligule, so it's not going to be membranous like this. It's going to look like a, a row of hairs here. You know, the challenge with goosegrass, you know, from a post-emergent standpoint, uh, depend, it really depends on the environment that you're in, whether you're dealing with warm or cool season turf grass, and the, your options are are limited there, and certainly as as these plants get bigger, the more difficult it becomes to control as well. So you've got a few options that you can look into for goosegrass control. You know, post emergence, you know, certainly something like a Pilex if you're in cool season turf uh, works well on uh, on uh, goosegrass. Pre-emergence herbicides. If if you're in a big enough area that has enough uh, goosegrass problems, then that's where your round two herbicide application. And when I mean round two, I mean um, your pre-emergence herbicide application that's going to hit around that sixty to sixty-five degree soil temperature range. That's where your pre-emergent service is going to benefit you the most for, for goosegrass control. But I would imagine that most of the issues with goosegrass in a residential setting is going to be spot treatment as a post-emergent. So typically, you're going to be dealing with one of these products here on the right. Um, application timing is going to be important um, You know, with something like um, you know, your smaller plants can be controlled with something like Dismiss NXT or Acclaim. Larger plants, um, you know, probably going to be a, achieved here with, with something like a Pilex or, or a Revolver. Again, you always check the label for specific turf rates and, and whether or not they're, they're, they're regis registered for home lawn use. Um, <clears throat> these are just examples of products that are labeled for goosegrass control. Uh, sometimes you have to be creative. Sometimes you just need to look at options that you have and go through uh, and make tank mixtures. So this is a, a revolver plus dismiss, uh, pro providing pretty good control out to 104 days post-emergence application. So those are some of the things that you have to look into as well uh, if you have that opportunity. Wild violet is one. Again, this is kind of as a heart-shaped leaf with a slightly serrated leaf. You'll see a lot of different violets um, species. You know, some of them have this purplish colored uh, flower. Others have a yellow flower or white flower. Uh, very problematic in warm season, excuse me, cool season turf especially. This is one where fall applications work best. Again, as I, I continue to harp on application timings, um, second best application timing would be in the spring, say a round two application. Uh, but uh, if you can uh, talk to your customers about application timings and, and continue to do things throughout the season and wait until and hold your big guns to, to the end of the season, this is one uh, along with dandelion that's going to be the most effective timing uh, to control wild violet. <clears throat> this is kind of an example of, of what can result. This is a fall application here on the right compared to an untreated area uh, on the left. And this was uh, an application that was done in September. Uh, the picture was taken uh, the following June. So that's the power of understanding the life cycle and when that weed is most susceptible uh, to, a, to a herbicide application. Uh, Virginia buttonweed, this is one that's becoming to, I'm getting 
short on time, so let me speed up. Uh, this is one that's getting uh, further and further north um, and uh, a very aggressive perennial weed, uh, very distinctive white flower um, that can be very destructive. Yeah, can form mats, uh, these maroonish uh, leaf, uh, excuse me, uh, stems. Uh, it's almost square, uh, but it has hairs going along the ridges of, the, of, of this uh, weed. Uh, but it can be very difficult to manage. It can produce below ground seeds as well. Dollar weed is another uh, issue uh, throughout the, the coastal regions uh, of the country. Uh, it can be mat forming, can be very aggressive. Um, it almost looks like an umbrella because uh, that stem comes directly up in the middle of the underside of the leaf. And this is different than something like dichondra, where uh, dichondra comes in and creates almost a heart-shaped leaf as well. Um, thrives in poorly drained soils. Uh, interesting thing is a lot of the, the, the weeds, uh, like Virginia buttonweed and dollarweed, Florida betony, you know, et cetera, they can be controlled with very similar um, products. You know, metsulfuron certainly uh, is a strong candidate for, for applications. Blindside is a great example of, uh, of a product that can do both of those. Again, sometimes you may have sequential applications that are needed depending upon when you make those applications. Uh, and there's some other products as well that are, that are good options. Uh, one thing about triclopyr is just be mindful of the formulation that you're using uh, because sometimes, you know, an ester formulation, for example, um, as the temperatures increase, the volatility of that product increases. So it can result in a lot more turf injury uh, if you're using a triclopyr ester formulation uh, later in the season. So be mindful of that. Thank you, everybody, for coming.